Hello, and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Jim Erling, and on today's episode, we're going to be discussing the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And with me to discuss the topic is Father William Jenkins, pastor of the Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio, where only the traditional Catholic Mass is offered on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Father, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jim. It's good to be here. Uh, Father, to start our, our, top, our discussion off here, uh, there have been many movies that have come down through the history of American cinema that uh, have been considered controversial. Um, many of them have been uh, considered blasphemous towards religion and insulting to Christians. And whenever Christians protest these things, uh, very little seems to make, uh, make of it or come of it. Now we have a film where it's kind of having the opposite effect, where uh, people on kind of the other side of the uh, uh, cultural spectrum are rather upset about this film. And it has uh, raised a protest that is in many ways unprecedented. Uh, my first question to you is, what is it about this film that is creating this social phenomenon? Well, Jim, actually, in, since uh, the beginning of the motion picture industry, uh, there have been uh, over 100 films about the life of Christ. But certainly, as you say, this film has attracted the most attention and uh, just raised a firestorm of controversy. And I think it's because this film is unlike any of the others. It focuses on the last 12 hours of our Lord's life, from about 3 o'clock in the morning on Good Friday until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it is during this time that our Lord accomplished the two great things that he said he came to do. He uh, said that he came to suffer and die for us for the redemption of mankind and reparation for sin. And he said that he came to establish his church. Both of those were accomplished by his passion and death on the cross. Uh, so narrowly focusing on this uh, actual, this, this great work of our Lord and its fulfillment is uh, certainly controversial in the world today. But I think uh, this film has attracted more attention and more controversy because the world itself has changed. Mm. Uh, there's a great deal of anti-Christian spirit in the world today. It has been in the, uh, in the ascendancy for quite a few years now, uh, decades, in fact. And uh, it, it, is, it has drawn an enormous amount of uh, firepower. And so uh, anything that makes our Lord look like our Lord, mm -hmm. really, looks like, makes him look like the redeemer of the world, makes him look like uh, God and man, who he truly is, is going to attract a lot of attention uh, much of it negative from uh, the anti-Christian uh, influences in the world today, especially in the in the media industry. Mm -hmm. Well, dealing with uh, some of the specific criticisms that have been um, libeled against the film, uh, one of the most outspoken and that you hear so often now is that the film itself is actually anti-Semitic. Mm. Um, and uh, it, uh, to put it simply, is that the case? And, and what could possibly be the source for that accusation? Well, you know, it's a case of beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. If uh, someone were Jewish and very sensitive to, uh, you know, the, the impression that uh, Christians would get from the movie, he might be afraid that it will make a resentment against him for being Jewish. If he's particularly sensitive about this, uh, if there is someone who is truly anti-Semitic and he goes to the movie, he will see anti-Semitism in the movie But uh, because that's what he wants to see. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think perhaps to some extent that's what both sides want to see. Um, but the fact is for the vast majority of people, and especially for those who really are Christian, meaning that they really do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who gave his life for their salvation, they won't even think about this in seeing this movie. It wouldn't even occur to them that this movie is anti-Semitic because it wouldn't even occur to them to blame the Jews or the Romans or anybody. Mm -hmm. the, the fact <clears throat> is that someone who is really a Christian seeing the movie would think of really nothing but what our Lord is doing in the movie. Everything else is kind of a given to him. Mm -hmm. But what our Lord is doing is so impressive that he's suffering and he's dying, and uh, so, so treated so cruelly, suffering so, so brutally, that when someone who, who really has any shred of faith when he walks into the theater, he's going to walk out 
with one thought in mind, and that is, I have been redeemed at a great price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be so overwhelming to him that it's going to be the only thought he's going to have when he comes out of the theater. I have been redeemed at a great price. And that's going to prompt him then to make certain conclusions. He's going to think, what must my soul be worth to God? What, how good God must be? Uh, how terrible sin must be? Because it offends a God so great and mm -hmm. so loving and so holy. How awful hell must be that Christ would suffer so to save me from it. Mm -hmm. And how wonderful heaven must be that our Lord would suffer so to enable me to have it. All of these thoughts are consequent upon this, this tremendous uh, realization. I have been redeemed at a great price. The, the you mentioned the, that, that feeling, uh, and I have seen the film, and I know you have seen the film, and I, and I would certainly agree with that. Do you think that the accusations of anti-Semitism really could be a pretext for a fear that this film may have an evangelizing effect upon people? Oh, yes. Well, actually, there's a, a rabbi from Israel who is a, a higher up in the Orthodox Union a uh, Jewish organization out of Israel. And this organization has uh, sent 300 videotapes of a program the organization provided as an instruction for Jews about the movie The Passion. Mm -hmm. And the rabbi, his name is Rabbi Weinraub. Uh, Weinraub, I think, is the name here. I have a little bit of information on that mm -hmm. from the Israeli Na Israel National News Service uh, that uh, this rabbi and others who joined him in this project say that the real concern that they have with the movie is not for any anti-Semitic feelings it will arouse in the souls or the, in, the, in the minds of non-Jews. It is primarily a concern with the effect the movie will have on their fellow Jews. Mm. He comes right out and says it. He says, because this movie makes uh, the figure of Jesus so compelling and, and, and so good that he's afraid that his fellow Jews will be drawn to Jesus. And this is what he's actually afraid of. He says right out, we're much more concerned about that than we are about with any, uh, you know, any fears of anti-Semitic anti feelings being aroused by it. So yes, I, I think they are afraid of it, and I think they have reason to be afraid of this in the sense that uh, it is so compelling that I think there are Jewish people of very good will who might be interested in finding out could this have been the Messiah? Could this have been the Savior? And uh, if it is, then maybe they would be drawn to him. Uh, one thing that they're very, very furious about is the idea of being converted. You know, even the modernist church of Vatican II and the present Vatican has come out and, and essentially said that the Jewish people have their own economy of salvation and they don't even have to believe in Christ or, or regard him as the Savior, the Redeemer, the Messiah, to be saved. They have their own arra separate arrangement with God, mm -hmm. which is totally contrary to the Scripture and completely contrary to the Catholic faith, too. Mm -hmm. um, the idea about the movie being anti-Semitic, I mean, if we're talking about those who are descended from Abraham, okay, those who are blood descendants of Abraham, mm -hmm. which makes them Jewish, then... I mean, some of the villains in the movie are Jews, but all of the heroes are Jews, every right. single one of them. Right. So all of the good guys are Jews, you know. And, uh, but good or bad, they are all abused by the Romans. In fact, the lady who played the part of the Blessed Mother and played it so admirably, mm -hmm. Maya Morgenstern, mm -hmm. Morgenstern her, her name means morning star in German. Um, her parents survived the Holocaust, hmm. and her father read over the script with her before the movie was made, and he approved of it. He said he was proud of her for doing this. And uh, she didn't see any anti-Semitism in this movie at all. In fact, she was kind of surprised by it. She said, well, I'm Jewish, but I'm also from Romania. She's in Bucharest. And Romania is like the last great vestige of the Roman Empire. Hmm. The Latin language was the official language spoken on the floor of the Romanian parliament until the 1920s sometime. So this is really like the last vestige of the old Roman Empire. So here's a woman who says, well, I'm, I'm Roman and I'm Jewish 
So I, I could be blamed for both sides of, you know, who killed, who killed Christ or who killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. But she's not thinking in those terms. And anybody else who's fair about this film isn't going to be th even thinking about these terms. Um, they're going to be thinking only about what our Lord did. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that's going to matter to them. And the rest of them, you know, for the rest, they're going to say exactly what Mel Gibson said and what you know, anybody else who you know, thinks like a Christian says, well, I, I contributed to our Lord's death. I have a personal, um, personal responsibility for our Lord's death, and that's the responsibility that really concerns me. Um, much has been made about a, uh, uh, accusations against Mr. Gibson personally that he is somehow undermining um, a, a, a pronouncement by Vatican II that, uh, that the Jews were not collectively responsible for the death of Christ. And, and that almost suggests that the, the pre-Vatican II church implicitly held this view that they somehow were collective, alleging collective responsibility against the Jews. This certainly wasn't the case prior to Vatican II, was it? No, no, it wasn't the church's teaching. And uh, I mean, let's face it, there, there were always certain members of the church who thought like that, mm -hmm. uh, and there always will be as long as there are flawed people in the church. Our Lord said in his parables that the church consists of the good and the bad together in this world. Um, but the implication, you know, implies something that is not true. Um, the fact is uh, that, I mean, all of the apostles are Jews, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, were following God's command mm -hmm. uh, in, in carrying this out. In fact, um, you know, true Catholics would have to have a unique regard for the Jews if they, you know, truly are Jews and they truly are descended from Abraham and do have that bloodline from Abraham. They'd have to regard them as our, our Lord's kith and kin, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, have a particular love for them. But what some of them, the more liberals, don't understand is uh, because they have no faith, uh, they have, their faith is in the world. But true Jews understand mm -hmm. that if you have what you consider to be the true faith and you care about other people, you want to give them that faith right. as the greatest gift that you have to give, even if they wind up putting you to death for it, as they did with the apostles all over the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, love requires that you want to give them the great, greatest treasure you've got, and that is your faith and hope in Christ and uh, redemption and salvation and eternal life. Mm -hmm. What more could one give than that? Right. Uh, it, this uh, film has had a, a, I guess, a, a profound effect on, on many uh, Christian religions and, and, and many, many Christian faiths, but there really is a, a uniquely this is a uniquely Catholic interpretation in many in many senses, isn't that the case, Father? It is. Uh, much of what is not in the Gospels comes from the writings of a, uh, a mystic, uh, a nun named the Venerable Anna Katharina Enric, who lived oh from about uh, about 1775 to about 1825 or so, some, somewhere in that area, and she had uh, private revelations with regard to private revelations, the church says only there's nothing contrary to faith in them. They are worthy of belief, mm -hmm. uh, but she does not put them on the same level with the Gospels mm -hmm. or public divine revelation. But these, uh, these revelations that were given to Anna Katharina Emmerich have been printed in the form of a book called The Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ. And Mel Gibson said he was drawing quite a bit of his material from this, this work, uh, the revelations of Anna Katharina Emmerich. For example, uh, the, the, the serpent in the garden of Gethsemane, <clears throat> tempting our Lord, mm -hmm. you know, the, the devil there and the serpent, um, that is recorded in Anna Katharina Emmerich's work. Uh, the protest of Simon of Cyrene, uh, yelling at the Romans stop, to stop beating our Lord as they did and telling them that he will not take another step unless they stop. That is in the writing of mm -hmm. Anna Catherine Emmerich, mm -hmm. which is kind of peculiar in a way because, I mean, in the writing of Anna Catherine Emmerich, she shows uh, some of the Jews, <coughs> like the, the officials of the, of the, Jewish, the Jewish leaders, um, you know, as, as the Gospels say, plotting for our Lord's condemnation because they find him to be a threat. Uh, 
and other Jews uh, defending him mm -hmm. and speaking up in favor of him. And yet, although she has both sides, uh, pro and con, she's accused of being anti-Semitic. Um, uh, you're not allowed to show both sides. You're only allowed to show the one side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, well, speaking of uh, some of the, uh, I guess, extra biblical uh, infusions in the film, um, one of them being uh, that you made reference to, and I, I would consider it probably the third most memorable character in the film after the actor that portrays our Lord and the actress that portrays our Lady. And that, that, that is this satanic figure that uh, um, uh, Mr. Gibson um, used. Um, it, in a word, it's, it's very chilling uh, mm -hmm. to see this. Um, and I'm curious, is this pure artistic license, or is this something that's consistent with uh, what we know about Satan from uh, the, the Gospels and the writings of the saints and so on and so forth in some of the scenes that we see the, the Luciferian figure? Uh, Gibson's portrayal of Lucifer in the movie is, is right on, I believe. Mm. Uh, there's nothing inconsistent about uh, this portrayal of uh, Lucifer. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the, the hairlessness, the, the, the shaved head, the, even the eyebrows are shaved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like a serpent, uh, the the um, the total lack of blinking. This is this hard stare, just like a serpent. Mm -hmm. And even when it moves, I mean, it glides or slithers almost. It doesn't walk. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's meant to be sort of like a serpent in in human form, in human uh, outward appearance. But then you see the serpent slither out from under the robe and come to our Lord. And our Lord crushes the, the head of the serpent there. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, this, this same imagery, uh, this, this refers back to a prophecy. It refers back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. After the serpent had tempted, successfully tempted Eve, and Eve successfully, successfully tempted Adam, mm -hmm. God came into the Garden of Eden and confronted <clears throat> them. And he spoke to the serpent first, and he said, because thou hast done this, accursed art thou amongst the beasts, right? But then he went on to say, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, or we would say offspring or, or children, mm -hmm. child, actually, child, singular. Uh, she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Now, there are scholars who have known for years that that could be interpreted, he shall crush thy head, meaning not the woman, but the child of the woman. Either way, it doesn't, it doesn't really change anything. Even in your Douay Reims traditional Catholic Bible, it has a footnote there that explains that. And Catholic scholars have known this for years. Our Lady crushed the head of the serpent, either directly herself or indirectly through her, through her child, Jesus. The meaning is the same. The entity is between the devil and the woman, between Lucifer and Mary. And he was all, she was always his enemy, never his slave by sin, never his servant. Mm -hmm. No one questions that part, um, the accuracy of that, of that part of the uh, verse. But the point is, this idea of the serpent in the Garden of Gethsemane is an echo of the temptation in the Garden of Eden. In Gethsemane, mm -hmm. though, the devil knows that Jesus is the Messiah but does not know that he is truly God, the hmm. Son of God. Because he can't know that. That takes faith to know that. It's, it's something that is beyond the natural powers of the devil to even understand, because it takes the infinite power of God to <clears throat> assume a created nature, another nature. The devil can't do that. Even the Antichrist will not be the devil incarnate, the devil made man, in the mm -hmm. same way that God was mm -hmm. made man. So the devil knew that our Lord was a Messiah, but he did not know that he was truly the Son of God in the strict sense of the word, and that he was dealing with God. That's why, the, that's why Lucifer was tempting mm -hmm. Jesus. He was trying to almost talk him out of, uh -huh. of what he was about to do. And he was unaware of the futility of all that, apparently, right. because... In a blindness of his pride, mm -hmm. he didn't know. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, no man can redeem them. No man can pay for the sins of mankind. No, never. Remember that? Mm -hmm. I mean, from the devil's point of view, what a coup it would have been if he could have talked the Messiah out of fulfilling his mission. Mm -hmm. 
of course, again, not realizing that it was futile. Remember, the devil had tempted our Lord already. Correct. In, uh, in the desert, and then on the pinnacle of the temple, and then on the top of the mount, uh, Mount Tibidabo, as it's mm. called. I will give you the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof. But um, so the devil knew there was something special about our Lord, but to realize that this is truly God, no, he couldn't fathom that. So this was truly another temptation of Lucifer in the garden, this time the Garden of Gethsemane. But remember the devil baby? I, I do, yeah. I, how can you forget? This was so weird. Yeah, it was. Everyone asks, what was that all about? Mm -hmm. The devil holding this child. And what he's doing, well, this is during the scourging at the pillar. Mm -hmm. And you know something? It reminds us of the prophecy, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy offspring and her offspring, the devil's offspring. Mm -hmm. Well, we saw it represented in the arms of this, the devil, mm -hmm. and it's grotesque. It looks like a human gargoyle. Mm -hmm. Something else you might have noticed, and nobody else I've talked to has noticed this. It looks as though that child was nursing from the devil. Mm -hmm. Because when that grotesque face pulls away the black veil and turns and leers at our Lord lying there in, in his blood, mm -hmm. from the scourging, there is a black liquid all around its mouth and kind of, you know, among its teeth and dripping, dripping down its, its, uh, one corner of its mouth. And so it's nursing something like bile mm. out of the devil. And you know, that's, that's so poetically just because the devil fills its children with lies and deceit and filth and corruption. And the children of the world are like that. By the way, in the gospel, our Lord talks about children of the devil. Mm -hmm. He calls the Pharisees children of the devil because the, the, the devil is the father of lies. Mm -hmm. And those who lie and enjoy the lie and live the lie, he said, our Lord said, are worthy children mm -hmm. of the devil. Uh, speaking of, of the, the, the battle that's ongoing throughout the film and, of course, throughout history uh, between our Lord and Our Lady and, the, and this, the, Satan himself, um, there's this moment uh, in the movie where Christ announces that it is accomplished. And, um, and then you see, I think, if I remember correctly, the camera goes to this satanic figure and this kind of this screaming and yelling and almost fury. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess people could interpret that in a variety of ways, but, but we as Catholics and consistent with Christian teaching, what took place between our Lord's resurrection and that moment when he said, it is accomplished. Mm. Between his resurrection? Be be between, between when he said, it is accomplished, and then when, his, when he was oh. resurrected. What was going on I at see. that point? Well, uh, with regard to that scene where it shows a close-up of, of Lucifer's face and then the camera pulls away quickly and uh, Lucifer throws off the hood and you see the, the hairless baldness and it's screaming, just writhing like mm -hmm. a snake. Mm -hmm. Like the snake at the beginning was writhing. You know, mm -hmm. after our Lord crushed its head. Mm -hmm. This is actually a parallel to an earlier scene that happened just seconds before. And I don't know if people really caught that very often. But after our Lord died on the cross, you find yourself through the camera looking straight down on Calvary, and it's like the circle of Calvary. And it takes you a minute, well, a few seconds, to really get your bearings and realize, oh, I'm looking straight down from above. And you might even wonder, well, why this vantage point? Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden you see from the lens something detach, and it's a droplet of water mm. that comes right off the lens. You were actually looking at the scene of the crucifixion through this droplet of water as though it were the lens. And then it detaches and falls away. And it doesn't just fall straight down, in fact. It kind of weaves as though the wind is catching mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and you see it fall away. Then the camera shifts. This is genius, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mel Gibson said before the movie appeared, maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm a genius. I actually think he's a little bit of both. <laughs> kind of a crazy genius. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, then you see the drop at the other end as it hits the ground. And it splashes, and there's this great crack. And then the skies open up, and the rain pours down. Now, some people saw in that drop of water falling away from the lens not a drop of rain, but a teardrop, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought that was pretty interesting because it didn't, didn't even occur to me. Uh -huh. but, uh, but it was then that seconds later, 
you see the, the focus on the devil's face up close, and then the camera draws away. And this like the, the, the opposite of the motion of the camera uh, above Calvary and then down to the ground. This starts down at the ground in the face of the devil and then lifts way up. Mm -hmm. And you see the devil circled mm -hmm. by hell mm -hmm. and writhing as though it has suffered defeat, mm -hmm. a horrendous defeat. Mm -hmm. um, but our Lord, our Lord accomplished this defeat. You know, the devil suddenly realized what had taken place and that it was possible to pay for the sins of mankind. And when our Lord died on the cross, suddenly the devil understood something it could not understood before, understand before. It is possible that man could be redeemed, that the sins of the world could be paid for and repaired, but it was done by this particular Messiah because he was truly the Son of God. Mm -hmm. um, kind of concluding on this point, Father, um, rather quickly, the, the, uh, I see something happening here that, uh, well, I guess kind of the cultural impact of the film. There seems to be somewhat of a paradox happening simultaneously. We've got the rise of the militant homosexual movie with, with municipalities across the country issuing marriage licenses for, for same-sex unions, and yet we've got a film that very accurately portrays our Lord's passion, um, grossing domestically in excess of, of $200 million, and it's predicted to go north of $300 million. Um, are, we, we, what, are we witnessing a new era or a new phase in what many people term the cultural war? I believe we are, yes. Almost inevitably so. Um, there's going to be no real middle ground here. Uh, people are going to have to go one way or the other. Um, there's the teaching of Christ or the teaching of the world, mm -hmm. and in this case, the teaching of the devil, the Antichrist. And people are going to have to make a choice. Uh, when our Lord was an infant in his mother's arms, uh, Mary carried him into the temple. The prophet Simeon said he would be a sign of contradiction. That's really why this movie is so mm -hmm. controversial. Our Lord is still a sign of contradiction, mm -hmm. and he always will be. And people are going to have to declare themselves one way or the other. The middle ground is disappearing very fast. The gray area is disappearing very fast. People are going to have to declare themselves either for him or against him. But those who are against him, those who do not gather with him, will scatter. Well, thank you, Father. It certainly uh, seems to be a message of, of hope and love rather than hate and anti-Semitism, whatever else. And we thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. And please join us next, next week on What Catholics Believe.